Um, this talk is going to be a, sorry, can you hear me? I'm not sure, no. No? Okay. Uh, I guess I can talk now, okay. I'll just wait. <coughs> Is this better? No. No? How about now? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so this talk is going to be based on a project that I'm working on with Najib Ali, who is an economist at Penn State, and Greg Lewis, uh, who is at Microsoft Research New England. Uh, the talk is going to be about price discrimination under competition and how it relates to uh, information <coughs> signaling. Before I start, I want to talk a little bit about price discrimination. This is sort of the, the bread and butter for, for, of um, core classical microeconomic theory. The general idea is that, if I've, is that if I'm buying a product from, let's say, um, uh, let's say the theater, the theater, I, I'm willing to pay less perhaps than someone who's much older than me because maybe I've got more alternatives or less, uh, less of a budget. Similarly, um, when I try to um, buy access to go to a gym, I am much more willing to pay a higher price for a gym that's next to my house than I am for a gym that's across town because I get a lot of utility out of being able to go nearby. So if the gym that I'm getting a membership from can tell that I live nearby, they could charge me more uh, and extract some rent from me. This is let me formalize that a little bit. Um, so using the simplest model I can come up with, this is going to look very familiar to, to the economists among you uh, and maybe to the computer scientists as well. Suppose that I have a consumer of type theta, so uh, I'm, I'm a consumer and I'm located somewhere on the unit line between zero and one. Let's see if the, uh, the red thing, there we go. This is, this is me, I'm located somewhere here. Um, and let's say that, uh, that the distribution is uniform, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and I value going to the gym at some value, some core value V. It's some number. We're not going to worry about what it is. Uh, but the farther away I live from the gym, the gym is located at zero here, the, the, less I, the less it's worth to me. If it's really, really far away, maybe it's not worth it at all. Um, but I'll, I'll still buy the gym membership so long as it's worth something. What can the gym do if it knows exactly where I'm located? Well, it's very simple. The gym can, if the gym knows where I am, it's going to charge me exactly the amount that I'm willing to pay so that I'm indifferent between buying a membership or not, you know, plus minus epsilon. I'm not gonna worry about those. Um, and it's going to extract my maximal, maximum willingness to pay. This is sort of a classical result. This is going to be the, pr the price. This is just based on the quadratic loss here. Um, and the, the core thing I want you to take out of this slide is that I'm, my utility is going to be zero. I am weakly indifferent between buying a gym membership and not, and the gym has extracted all of the value that I get out of it. It's gonna make more money, I'm gonna make less, more, less utility. What about if the gym doesn't know where I am? Well, the gym knows that I'm located somewhere on the unit line. So what it can, the best that it can do and this, uh, this ties into some of the auction results we saw earlier, the best it can do is to maximize uh, over the price that it can charge to get, on average, the highest possible uh, rent out of me. So I'm, if I'm anywhere using this condition, or rather this condition, uh, if my type theta is anything less than the square root of v minus p, then I'm going to buy then I'm going to buy a membership. So knowing that uh, the gym is going to maximize over the expected, uh, oh, well, uh, the price times the probability that I'll buy a membership, and it'll set some price. It's, uh, in the uniform case, somewhere around 0.67 or something like that. What's the point here? Well, it's very simple. Looking at the consumer welfare, my well, for every type theta, uh, under perfect price discrimination, consumers get zero. Under no price discrimination, these are two extremes, consumers get something. And you know, decreasingly less uh, the farther away they are. But the, pe but the people who are really close to the gym can, can actually get a lot of value. 
the takeaway here, this is sort of the core Econ 101 punchline, is that price discrimination is bad for consumers. The more the gym knows where I am, the more it can extract away from me. So as a consumer, I don't want it to know where I am. I'd really rather it didn't. But one of the, the, the main point I want to make here, uh, and, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a second, is that this intuition that we have is really rooted in the idea that the gym is a monopolist. Um, so when I'm thinking about privacy and the ability of um, marketing firms to sell cookies or to spread information between, uh, between firms, these are issues that have, are coming up often these days uh, uh, in regulation in Europe and things like that. When I, when I think about privacy concerns, there's an intuition that I, I've, I think many of us have that uh, personal privacy aside, the more companies can know about consumers, the worse, the worse off the consumers will be. Pure, purely from a rent extraction perspective. Um, and this may not hold under competition. So let me, let me illustrate that a little bit. Let's take the simplest model of competition we can come up with that looks like the monopolist example I just gave you. We still have a consumer of type theta located on the unit line. But now we've got a gym on the left side at zero and another gym on the right side at one. So this looks like a hoteling model for those of you who know. But the gyms are still going to compete over the, over the consumers with their prices. So this is the, the direct analog to the monopoly example. So we're going to say, just to, to spell things out, a consumer theta's utility is going to be V minus the price he pays if he buys from the left guy minus the square distance to the left guy if he buys here, and the analog on the right. One minus theta squared is just the distance to the right. Um, and, we're, and this is going to be an equilibrium condition, but in general, we're going to ignore the outside option and say that the consumer will buy from, from whichever firm gives him more utility. Now let's look at, at the two cases that we had before. Perfect price discrimination and no price discrimination. Suppose you have perfect price discrimination. That is to say, the gym left and gym right, or firm, firm L and firm R, can, can price specifically to every type theta. They know exactly what theta is, and they can set up a specific price. Well, what do they do? In equilibrium, it must be that they compete over a type theta to the very core. This is Bertrand competition, right? So each type theta must be indifferent between buying from firm L at price PL and from R at price PR. So speaking a little bit loosely, um, it's not too difficult to show that in the unique undominated equilibrium, what will happen is that type theta will buy from the firm that's closer to him at a price that's either 1 minus 2 theta or 2 theta minus 1. That's this and this. But this must be an equilibrium, right? So he's offered, let's say, theta is between 0 and 1 half. Then from L is going to give him one minus price of 1 minus 2 theta, and from R is going to give him price of 0. And this must be true in equilibrium. Now what happens? if there's no price discrimination, which is to say the firms have no idea where type theta is. Well, we have a condition, sorry, uh, that the consumer will buy from firm L if and only if this is profitable. What that means is that there's a cutoff theta, theta hat. It's going to be this one minus the difference between PL and PR over 2 such that everyone left of theta of, of this cutoff is going to buy from firm R, from L, and, and everybody else is going to buy from firm R. So what do the firms do? Knowing this, they maximize their expected profits just like the monopolist does. They get some best response functions, and we can show that in equilibrium under the uniform distribution, they both arrive at a price of one. Well. This doesn't look too good for the consumers. This is almost like the, the inverse relationship, qualitatively, of the graph that we have for monopolists. Why is this happening? The point is that under, monop un under the monopolist setting, 
the firm is only pricing, is expecting to get everyone that he can when there's no price discrimination. And when there's perfect price discrimination, he'll charge, he'll be able to get everybody along the line who can afford it. When there's competition, this goes away. When there's competition under perfect price discrimination, in equilibrium, the firm will only be able to get consumers that are closer to it. And it will be priced down to the, to the point of indifference, no matter where theta is. So it can compete over, it can compete over everybody. But that competition is really only driving down the price for the people farther away. When there's no price discrimination, Firm L knows that it's not going to be able to get the people over here. It's just priced out. So it's not going to bother. It's only going to maximize its profits over the people who would be willing to buy, uh, for, to, willing to buy from it in the first place in equilibrium. So it's only setting a price that's considering the people up to here. This graph isn't quite right because, uh, in fact, under no price competition, consumers can do a bit worse. And I wanted to normalize things to look uh, comparable between the monopolist and duopolist. But qualitatively, the point stands. Under, uh, under this hoteling duopoly model, consumers do better in a domin dominating way under perfect price discrimination. So where does this lead us? The goal of this project is to connect this, this very basic intuition with an idea about signaling t of types and privacy. So we're going to consider two kinds of, ki kinds of information. Hard information, that is to say, credible, and credible things that can be checked, like demographics, maybe credit scores, police records, things that if you lied about, they could be verified. And soft information, which is something like, we're going to think of it as cheap talk, something like maybe survey results, things that you can lie about and nobody will be able to check. And we're going to ask, do consumers benefit or suffer when they have the ability to, give, to, to send these kinds of signals, hard or soft ones, to competing firms? This is going to be the answer. I'm going to preview it for you right now. This is the graph that we saw just, just now here looking at first degree price discrimination versus no, no price discrimination. What we're going to show, sorry, this clicker is a little bit buggy. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you. Um, what we're going to show is that when, you have, when consumers are able to signal their types to firms, but they're only able to use soft information, which is to say cheap talk, survey results, et cetera, in equilibrium, it's going to look a lot like the no price discrimination case. They're not going to get, they're not going to do very well. You can, this is a, a graph of price against type. So you can imagine this is, uh, the utility is going to be the inverse. The higher the price, the worse the consumers are. Um, with hard information, they can achieve first pr the the prices of under first, pr first degree price discrimination. And in fact, we're going to show that in the best possible equilibrium for, um, for consumers, they could do better. In fact, they could do anything in this triangle, anything in between the green and the blue. So I'm going to spend the rest of my talk trying to formalize this point a little bit. But this is the main takeaway. Yeah, Viad? So I'll get to that in a second. The main point will be this. In a competitive environment, the ability to certifiably or credibly signal your preferences can, ha can, can be beneficial to consumers. That is to say, price discrimination with hard information can be beneficial under competition. This was not true in the monopoly case. So I'm going to skip the related literature here, but we're, gonna, but we're basically mostly tying in the literature on uh, price discrimination in, in general. So Armstrong uh, and Vickers is about um, nonlinear pri price discrimination in markets, and Bergman, Brooks, and Morris is about the limits of price discrimination with different segmentation rules, and a literature on uh, the 
the cl a classical literature on economics on signaling, so Crawford, Sobel, and Dutch. Um, and we're going to talk about a model that's only slightly more general than the example I showed you. We're still going to have a consumer of types that's on, on the unit line. Um, I'm not going to insist that the distribution is, uh, of types is uniform, but it has to be nice. Um, the niceness essentially needs to guarantee the existence of a, of a pure strategy Nash equilibrium in the no information case. Um, there is a condition that guarantees that from a, a very technical paper by Capital and Nailbuff. I can talk to you about it offline. Um, and, the, and the utility structure is exactly as, as we had before. Now we're going to talk, now we're going to have signaling. So the way it's going to work is that um, at the beginning of a period, we're going to think of consumers as having some sort of type revealed. They every consumer finds out his own type. He can send a signal to the firms, some sig uh, a signal that looks like this message here. It's going to say, here's an in a subset, a, a subinterval AB of the unit line. The message says, I am in this interval. Um, and if we have mixed strategies, then it could be, I'm in this union of intervals, um, de facto. Um, so once the consumer sends a signal to the firms, the firms see this, uh, see this, they set prices accordingly for each consumer, given the signal that they have, and the consumer makes a purchase decision. And in, in the paper, we consider four types of signaling technologies, private versus public. By that, we mean asymmetric versus symmetric. Does the consumer have to send the same signal to both firms, or can he send one, one signal to one firm and one signal to the other? And soft information versus hard information, this is what I, what I mentioned before. Soft information, we're going to treat as cheap talk, which is to say the message can be literally anything, any, any uh, sub-interval AB in, in 0, 1. Hard information is going to mean that a signal that I, that I send, any signal that I send has to be feasibly true. That is to say, if I send the signal I am in interval, my type is in interval um, AB, then I must be in that interval. I cannot lie. Um, for this talk, I'm going to focus on soft versus hard in information. It turns out that the public-private divide is less interesting, um, but I'm happy to talk to you about it offline. Um, and, and this is uh, a bit of a technicality, but I wanted to put it up here up front. Um, the solution concept that we're going to use for equilibrium is going to be a perfect Bayesian equilibrium with this ex post stability condition, which intuitively says that um, consumers can resample their messages as much as they want. If I, if I go online and I submit a survey that says something, I can then go back uh, if I don't like the result, and do another survey. I can do this in, ad infinitum. And what that guarantees is that it, it essentially kills off some equilibria um, that, might be, th that might be problematic. Um, we justify this, this assumption from an empirical standpoint, mostly. It, the kinds of, pr the realm of problems that we're interested in is one in which feasibly I think people uh, can refine their signals as much as they want, especially online. Um, but what this essentially means is that there's not very much value in randomizing because the consumer will, will always uh, receive the, pr the best price he can with a signal that he is able to send. I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but I'm happy to discuss this more. Um, if people want later. Okay, so now some results. I mentioned to you before that under soft information, the best you can do is uninformative, is the uninformative case. Formally, what we mean is that, first of all, there exists, when, when consumers are able to send only messages that are cheap talk, only soft information like survey results they, that do not have to be verifiable, and they must send them to both sides, then first of all, there exists an uninformative equilibrium in which everybody pulls together. That is to say, nobody, no type theta can distinguish himself and be believed uh, from other types theta. And moreover, every other equilibrium is payoff equivalent. So under any equilibrium, when consumers are restricted by technology to cheap talk, soft signals, 
they will always receive the price um, from, from both firms. That is, as though there was no information and they had said no information at all. I'm not going to present a proof, but intuitively, um, everybody wants to pretend that they're the, center, the central type. The central type is, farther, is as far away from both firms as possible, so he's the one that's going to get competed over the most. Under cheap talk, there's nothing preventing um, consumers that are very far off from trying to pool together with this guy. Which is to say that no pool, no, no, uh, no pooling equilibrium that excludes any type of consumer can ever be stable. That's, um, I think, the core intuition. Hopefully that makes sense. It's different under hard information, though. Under hard information, there exists a fully separating equilibrium, which is to say everybody separates, everybody distinguishes himself, such that every, cons every consumer of type theta reveals himself perfectly to both firms. This is all for, for the public uh, symmetric signals to both firms. And the firms charge him the full information cost that we set, the price that we had before. Um, Moreover, this is the worst that consumers will ever do in equilibrium of under hard information. We, that is to say, we can show that there is no equilibrium uh, under which consumers receive a price that is worse than what they are guaranteed when their type is perfectly revealed. However, they could do a little bit better. In fact, and this is maybe um, a side point, the, the way to do better is for these extremal types to pool together. So the extremal type is going to be, on the left hand, a type that's indifferent between getting, um, getting a monopoly price over this interval from, from L and having a, a perfect full revelation case. We can show that this extremal type will exist under the nice conditions that we have. Um, and so it's actually, um, can be sustained in equilibrium under hard information that these guys will all pool together as one, send one signal, that is to say any theta in the interval zero, theta lower bar will send one signal. Everybody on the right hand extreme will send another signal and everybody else will reveal themselves perfectly. This can be sustained in equilibrium. The, the question, uh, the reason for this really relies on the idea of, of credible information, right? It's still true that everybody wants to pretend that they're this guy at one half. Why can't they do it? Well, under credible information, this is an equilibrium construction. Under credible information, if everybody here is separating, then it's impossible, it's, it, it, it's prevented, it's verifiably untrue that if somebody in this interval tries to pretend that they're together in a pool and tries to send the signal theta equals one half, they're just, they, they can't do it. What that means is that separation can be sustained for the guys in the middle, the guys who, per, who really prefer to be priced as who they are. In any case, um, regardless of how interesting you, you f find um, that particular result, the point stands that under hard information, you can do a whole lot better than under soft information. That is to say, we've constructed a mapping between the extremal case of perfect price discrimination and or as a, as a lower bound for the outcomes under hard information in the simple competitive duopoly case and soft information um, or, or cheap talk and this no, uh, no price discrimination case. So what are the takeaways? Um, consumers suffer, under, suffer from first degree price discrimination under a monopoly. This is an intuition that we've had for a long time, but this is reversed when you have Bertrand competition, at least in this, uh, in this sense. Um, hard or certifiable information can, uh, or signaling of, of certifiable information can allow consumers to benefit from the, the competitive pressures that push prices down when there, is, um, when there is competition. They benefit from being able to signal who they are. This might be counterintuitive. 
So when we think about regulation, about data privacy and, and transmission of, uh, what we really need to think about is how competitive is the market that we're dealing with? Does it look more like a monopoly or more like a duopoly or more an olig oligopoly or whatever? Because the, the direction of our, of our recommendation will depend on that. And that's the main point um, that we're trying to make here. So uh, this nice slogan, if one price is good, two are better, it has a dual meaning here. On the one hand, uh, it might say something about competition versus monopoly when you have competition. First degree price discrimination, that is to say, um, a finer a refinement of, of prices can do you better. Uh, and also just on the, um, on, the, on the side of competition versus monopoly holistically, stepping aside from the idea of information, um, competitive pressures can help consumers, but we already knew that. Um, so I wanted to be brief, uh, so I wanted to keep it to sort of the most uh, poignant parts of the paper, but there's a, a bit more to find in the draft that we'll put up pretty soon. Uh, one is private versus public signaling. What, uh, how do these results interact when you, ha when you can send asymmetric signals, that is to say, um, signal A, B, A1, B1 to firm L and A2, B2 to firm R. Do the results hold, roughly? Um, and moreover, I talked about how, how uh, the competitiveness of a market should change how we think about whether or not to promote regulate or to have regulation that allows for or promotes um, signaling and, and data transmission or not. It should depend on how competitive the market is. Well, we have uh, developed a notion of market power and show how, um, how, the, uh, how the best equilibrium for consumers changes under the different types of, of signaling schemes uh, when, one, when one firm is much more powerful or has much more market power than the other. Um, that's all I have.